Welcome everyone to the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research Think and Drink series of virtual talks. We hope you're all well and as healthy as possible given the state of the world in which we live. I'm Ken Giroux, a member of the steering committee of the Wyoming Institute. We've been offering these think and drink conversations all this pandemic sized year. Uh, this is the 22nd of them this year. And we have had close to 2,500 attendees and or people looking at the conversations on our YouTube channel. It's been our deepest pleasure to bring these into the world. And we're grateful to all of you, the attendees who are here, and of course the panelists and many more for the preceding Think and Drinks for participating along the way. We'll start up again in late January when the University of Wyoming semester swings into gear. Our title this evening is The Illusion of the American Dream versus the Reality of the Death of Black Wall Street. In a moment, I'll introduce a student who will introduce our moderator, but first a couple of technical notes for those in attendance. If you want to see all the speakers, you can press a button down in the bottom of your screen that says gallery view. If you want to see only the current speaker, that same button will toggle back and forth between gallery and, uh, and uh, in individual speaker. The panelists will always see all of the panelists. I mean, this is for the folks who are just attending. You can type comments and questions into the chat and everybody can see them. If you type questions into the Q&A box, uh, only the speakers will see them. So as an attender, attendee, you get to choose how you want to or where you want to phrase your question or comment. If you want to keep in touch with us, you can send us an email and we'll add you to our mailing list. I will type the address into the chat box shortly. And you can also see the recordings of our past events on our YouTube channel. And I will put that link into the chat box also. Okay, uh, Timberly Vogel, a UW graduate student uh, a research assistant with the Black Studies Center uh, will now kick off the evening. I will disappear and she will introduce our moderator for the night. Thank you, Timberly. Uh, thank you, Kenneth, and thank you everyone for being here uh, and welcome to the conjunction of the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research in concert with the University of Wyoming's Black Studies Re uh, Research Center. Um, as Kenan said, my name is Timberly Vogel. I am the Director of Community Engagement and a Research Assistant within the University of Wyoming's Black Studies Center. Uh, and before we get started, just want to go over some of the um, overarching goals of the Black Studies Center at UW. Um, first one being to create an institutional platform that will dedicate efforts and resources to supporting culturally responsive teaching, rural community focused engagement and evidence-based research related to Black Studies. Um, secondly, inspire and provide students with opportunities to understand and appreciate the importance and interrelations of the complex concepts and theories that constitute Black studies, especially in rural spaces. Uh, three, assist students in securing the necessary skills to think critically about, convey, and articulate the conditions of the Black experience by developing a sense of cultural insight to identify and understand patterns of historical development. And lastly, to introduce students to the fundamental rigors of graduate research to comprehend the importance of historical interpretation, the theoretical underpinnings. Uh, and in just a moment, I'll introduce tonight's moderator for the Think and Drink. Um, but first, just a couple of technical notes, sort of as Kenneth went over. Um, we encourage everyone to participate in the conversation. Um, and like Kenneth went over, there's a chat box as well as a Q&A box. If you're interested in submitting questions or just contributing to the dialogue, please feel free to. Um, but Nonetheless, I will go on to introduce tonight's moderator, um, my dear advisor and, and a great um, mentor to me, Dr. Frederick Douglas Dixon, who is the executive director of the UW Black Studies Center. Um, so please join me in welcoming our moderator. Thank you, Timberly. And I wanna say first, thank you for all that come that are here. But one thing I wanna be very clear about is that for us, particularly those of us in a professional role, the youngest is the most important. And I've grown to know Timberly in, inside the classroom and outside of the classroom. And she is indeed what our future <clears throat> looks like. So thank you, Timberly, for all your help 
And you know exactly what I mean as we move forward. So we should all be thinking in that particular matter. So thank you so much, Timberly, for all your work and what you will do. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you to the panel. So good evening, everybody. And welcome, everybody, to a very important conversation. Uh, the Wire Institute of Humanities Research considers these a think and drink. So feel free to do both. We would much rather see the thinking part begin, but feel free, as the title says, to think and drink. Um, today's conversation is very important, and it's about the death of Black Wall Street. And we look at it in a very particular manner, as you see these scholars before you, from a particular frame, from a particular tradition, from a particular background, with like-minded ideals, paradigms, thoughts, heroes, enemies. So as we move forth, I want to introduce our panel tonight. And I want to begin by introducing one of, of University of Wyoming's scholars, uh, Professor Chad Robinson. Chad Robinson is dedicated to um, the lens that extends the mainstream narrative. But he travels extensively when we talk about knowing history. You got to go places to know places. So Chad and I have had more than one serious excursion amongst those that we call those who are the leaders and experts, particularly about the civil rights movement in Mississippi in the South. And if you can imagine being in Mississippi or South Carolina in July, one of the hottest days of my life, I still remember. But that was one time Chad and I got to at the same time visit Mother Emanuel Church after the atrocities of Dylan Root. We were together for that. So he's here, he's gonna give us his thought. And then Dr. Courtney Pierre Joseph, from Lake Forest College and from the University of Illinois, I must always say, she's here as well and she's gonna give us our thought, but I need to take this time right now when we talk about the difference between young scholars and what we call those who came before us. What I have for you tonight is something that I have been waiting for for years. We have Dr. Raymond Winbush. And if you don't know Dr. Raymond Winbush, his iconic status will come to you as he speaks, but make sure you go back and read the books that he's produced. One particular that is a must if you're discussing reparation is will, does America, what America owes, if we think about it. It's a very, it hooked me, the book in itself. Should America pay is the title. And it hooked me from the very beginning. But Dr. Winbush, comes from a legacy that I was trained for. So it's like he indirectly trained me. So as we sit here amongst each other, we want you to feel free. And we encourage you to use the chat box, become involved. But this is going to be a conversation that will bring the knuckles to the white part. We will bring to you what we call esoteric information about the death of Black Wall Street. And we do not celebrate nor, commem nor commemorate this 100 year anniversary, which will take place in 1921 in May. But we do reckon with it from the lens that challenges the mainstream there. So now when I think about this, when we have this short time together, we wanna ignite a dialogue that will challenge the dominant discourse by examining esoteric information about this particular topic, particularly that will elevate the whole of humanity to higher academic excellence, but we came to add to, dismantle, disrupt, and interrupt the mainstream there. And when we think about that, those things that we are taught that are considered to be dictum, and let me get straight to it, the white architects of black education. So we came to challenge tonight in that regard. So a wise man once said, those who can't treat you right, can't teach you right. So as we move forward and we think about how we set the pace, because as Dr. Wimbush said, the death of Black Wall Street didn't come out of, what did you say, Doc? Came out of a context. It absolutely came out of a context. If you would go and feel free about laying the groundwork for how we'll proceed, and we thank you for being here, Doc, salute. Well, you know, I, I was very, very fortunate. I consider one of the most fortunate things in my life that when I was doing my doctorate, thousands of years ago uh, at the University of Chicago that my teacher was John Hope Franklin. Uh, his father, Buck Franklin, was the lawyer for the victims of Black Wall Street. 
So at that time, Black Wall Street, this is in the 70s, was only about 50 years old. And Dr. Franklin's memory of it uh, and his father's stories about it will freshen his memory. And, and even as he was a teacher, he was very emotional about it. I mean, it was something that, and he, he had dismissed almost all of the white narratives of what happened on those two days in uh, May and June of uh, 1921. Uh, the context, you know, I always think when we talk about Black Wall Street, we always talk about the massacre, and that's very important. But we have to understand that uh, Oklahoma became a state in 1907. And the Constitutional Convention that put it together put built segregation into the entire context of what Oklahoma would be. A lot of Black folk had settled there. And instead of black folk feeling they were, they felt disenfranchised, but what they also felt was that we were gonna create our own community. And they did. Booker T. Washington visited there and he was the one that dubbed it the Black Wall Street, that it was our Black Wall Street. Um, the context also had a lot to do with media because uh, the racist president, uh, Woodrow Wilson was chortling uh, a few years back, you know, about birth of a nation, which the NAACP and other civil rights organizations were denouncing, but which Woodrow Wilson uh, showed at the White House to a enraptured audience. Uh, Woodrow Wilson arguably is one of the most racist presidents that we had in this country. And we also see the rise of the Klan. And, and, and eerily, another thing that was occurring uh, the country was just getting over a pandemic, uh, the 1918 uh, flu pandemic that lasted a couple of years. So all of that went into what was going on at um, Black Wall Street. I'm going to stop here because I, I wanted to set that context, but one of the things that we don't talk about was the absolute anger and jealousy, that's the only word that I could use of the white community of Black Wall Street. Uh, banks, schools, uh, an airline, if you please, in 1921 Absolutely. that flew, flew people to Denver. I mean, it was an incredibly prosperous community. And one of the things I don't like to hear is that when Black folk among ourselves sometimes say, well, we need to you know, engage in self-help you know, we depend too much on the white man, whatever. None of Black Wall Street was dependent on white people for absolutely anything. And so we have engaged in self-help. I always say that the greatest self-help during the 20th century was the civil rights movement. And I also point to Black Wall Street. So I want to stop there and let my colleagues talk, but I wanted to set the context of what was going on at that time. Thank you, Doc. I want to further the context by using something very particular. I want to use what we call de jure laws on the book, separate but equal. This is America and how America would move into the 20th century. We can step back and go to the Mohawk Conference on the Negro question in 1890 and find that the question was, what should be done with the presence of the troublesome Negro for maximum exploitation? So it's separate but equal on the books. And then when we think about social movements, a couple social movements come into play. The large social movement is the American lynching movement. That's the social movement when we think about that. And what Dr. Chachua Sundiata calls from the University of Illinois called the nadir of the lynching movement. And inside of that is a brewing biological social movement that talks about the eugenics movement and how inferior blacks should not populate which you again revisited by World War II and what Hitler did to the world, the eugenics movement, two social movements that have us looking to the Black, of Wall, Black, Black Wall Street as a way of becoming far more serious and we dissect it in a much more into intellectual manner. So one of the things when we think about lynching as a spectacle, what it does, lynching as a spectacle, it does many things. One of the things was its sanctity for white women and how they needed to be separated from black men, those beasts. 
Also, what it does, if there's a financial component that Ida B. Wells allow for us to think about in Southern Horrors. So there is this land grab, which you'll, we'll discuss earlier. But think about the spectacle on two ends, those who were lynched and the lynchers. What does that do long term? Well, for the lynchers and empowers, but for the one who is lynched, what does that do to his family? So, Dr. Joseph, I know you're ready because I see you sitting there. Um, if you would like to continue about grounding this theory that Dr. Wimbish put, and I'm trying to further it, feel free and thank you. Um, just again, thank you for having me on um, this this panel this thank evening. You. This is thank you. Thank you. Epic. This is epic. Um, you know, to be to be amongst such thinkers. So. I mean, the context, it's a thing I'm always yelling at my students about in their papers, like what is the information about what the world looks like that leads to this sort of event, right? What Dr. Woodbush was saying is that it doesn't come out of nowhere. My work also allows me to think about this from a diasporic perspective oftentimes and the importance of black internationalism. We talked about World War II, but the importance of World War I and black soldiers and black nurses and people involved in the world effort understanding in the midst of the new nadir, right? Like that it doesn't have to look this way um, by spending time overseas. And coming back with that kind of what, you know, eventually will be kind of deemed that new Negro attitude of the 1920s is this um, willingness to push back against these white narratives and these laws of Jim Crow and these stereotypes popularized over and over again through various minstrel shows, Birth of a Nation, you talked about. But at the same time as this is happening, this is also um, during the US occupation of Haiti that is happening between um, 1915 and 1934, which if we look at the defender, we see in leather black press, we see um, intellectual thinkers talking about these things in conjunction with one another, like how are the lynching of people who are fighting against white supremacy globally and at this point like a neo-colonial um, occupation of a, of a black land um, that is close to the United States also informs then, um, you know, how folks are thinking about and contextualizing what ends up happening at, at Black Wall Street as well. Well, thank you for that. And I think that, again, you nailed it right in the middle of the bullseye. A couple more things that I want to put on as far as what we're creating here as the context. Let's think about the red summer of 1919. In Chicago, a young man, Eugene Williams, floats to the wrong part or past the black and white line of Lake Michigan, and his head is crushed because he is pelted with rocks from an Irish group called the Hamburgs, who eventually bring about a political revolution that rises what we call Mayor Daley, the boss, Mayor Richard J. Daley, number one. So there's a political context, but I want to take one step before we get to my brother Chad. I want to go back to the importance of Ida B. Wells and Lynch and how her social capital became part of this story. Well, March 9th, 1892, three of her friends were killed Thomas Moss, Calvin McDowell, and Will Stewart. We call it the lynching at the curb. They were not actually lynched. They were shot. But she gives this scathing critique. Now, she was so close to these young men, Thomas Moss, she was the god, she was the godmother of his daughter. So when we talk about Ida B. Wells, what Ida B. Wells says, she puts this into the picture of lynching. She gives it a financial component. She talks about that how long will white men still use the excuse of black men and white women not being attracted to each other, particularly white women being attracted to black men. So socially, she, she stretches, she widens the thought. But understand, after the death of Calvin, um, Thomas Moss, Calvin McDowell, and Will Stewart, she writes to the entire world, move to Tulsa. So her social capital creates this, what we know as a mini migration. So when you think about that, Chad, please continue. And thank you for coming, my dear brother. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I'd like, I, I'm more of a historian, so I'd like to use a term called ma'afa, um, a key Swahili word meaning disaster. Um, it is used to describe 500 years of warfare and genocide experienced by African people under enslavement and colonialism 
and they're continued. That's what you're talking about, uh, 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 Dr. Dixon, continued impact on African people throughout the world. Uh, so that's an important term I want to use. Uh, lynching is nothing new, right? Lynching is something that, uh, 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 or the form of brutality, right? Was used to put, to instill fear within the slaves. They would bring out, you know, uh, a slave who, who they would call acting up and they would do many brutal things to them um, to give a, uh, 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 context to the rest of the uh, slaves so that they understand how to act. And after Jim Crow or during Jim Crow, obviously uh, it was used not to uh, uh, to show example, but it, it was definitely show to, to instill fear in the uh, uh, the blacks who who might have had more opportunity than some of the whites, right? And that's where we, we find the term nativism, right? Uh, uh, these whites are uh, uh, unionized and they're trying to uh, ensure their employment, their place in society. And um, so lynching through the KKK, right? Is one of the um, most, most uh, effective ways that they used it. And I have a question where I, I have, um, how important are black people uh, to America, right? Um, and I have a degree in economics and I always tell my students that if you are confused, follow the money. The money will clarify everything. And where do people put their money, right? Do they put it in the black communities? Do they put it in black education? So that is my question, uh, where, what is important, right? Lynching was not important and has never been important to America, right? So your question is how important are black people to America? Okay. No, okay. You're more, more. Well, well, hold, hold one second, okay. Doc. I wanna clean this up and, and swing it right to you. Um, when we think about what we've talked about, the nadir of the lynching movement. When we've talked about what we call white massive resistance to so-called perceived and practical gains, individual and group gains of blacks was very violent. But let me tell you, there's a spirit in black folks that a lot of people, particularly the mainstream narrative never discusses. So one event for all of you all out there, one event that you can put as a reminder and they say as a reminder, always benefits the believer, is the Houston mutiny of 1917. When we hear about the Houston mutiny of the 1917, this is what we call our remedy to this white massive resistance from the 24th Infantry World War I veterans, where they fought back to the point where they became, if you will, those who took the lead in fashioning what it would look like when we came to a rebellion, when it came to literally a revolt. So it's something you got to think about. But Doc, as we move forward, when we talk about Sarah Page and Dick Rowland and this actual event, I think we're primed right now because we've used events. We've looked at the social atmosphere. Chad injected the economic piece into it. So Dick Rowland and Sarah Page. Well, you know, I'm glad because that's what I wanted to talk about. This whole idea of the white woman as the oil of white supremacy. And, you know, Dr. Franklin told us he strongly believed that there had been a relationship, a sexual relationship between the two teenagers, Dick Rowland and Sarah Page. And that what happened in the elevator to this day, we still don't know. Absolutely. The black, the black community of Tulsa believed that they were having an affair. Uh, the white community also believed that, uh, that he was trying to rape her, which was a nice way of covering up whether that he to justify the so-called lynching that occurred. Uh, we don't know, you know, I'm still a hundred years later, we still just don't know enough about what started uh, Black Wall Street. We know it was triggered by that incident. Um, 
we know that there were so many lies told. Dr. Franklin would always tell us there were so many lies told. For example, that first confrontation outside of the jail when yes, uh, Dick was uh, Dick Rowland was arrested, we know that 12 white men were killed. But yes, some of the reports said that 12 black folk were killed. But all the eyewitnesses said that 12 black uh, people, I mean, 12 white men were killed by the black folk. Um, there's even a dispute uh, about whether or not bombs were used, that airplanes were used to uh, bomb Black Wall Street. There's no dispute about that. Walter White and John O. Franklin, as well as uh, they all said that they had uh, saw airplanes dropping turpentine bombs on the Black community. So even now, we don't, we don't even have the correct death count about how many people were killed there. Uh, Dr. Franklin said that it was somewhere between three and 400 black folk were killed and that many whites were killed, but they were more unreported deaths because they wanted to make it appear as if whites had gotten the better of black folk. And they did in terms of the destruction of the black community. So there's a lot that we still don't know. And, um, and a lot of this, I mean, we, we just, what, in October, I think, they're still uncovering uh, unmarked graves where black yes, folks were dumped into these graves, unmarked, piled on top of each other. So we're still finding out stuff about this. And so, I'm gonna say something about reparations too, but we'll do that later on. Okay, so okay. the way that the research, some of the research has revealed that Dick Rowland and Sarah Page were both considered to be wards of the state. And they were both at one time living in a facility. So they had this relationship. Now, we mean they knew each other as young people. So this is after the time that they had spent as wards of the state. But like Dr. Wimbush said, there's something that happens in this elevator in the Drexel building downtown on a holiday when most buildings are closed. That's and right. this is the only building that he can go in to get water because of separate but equal. And then it kind of plays itself out. What you think about that, Dr. Joseph? Ida B. Wells. I think of Ida B. Wells here. I think of the Red Record, I think, which is one of my favorite um, historical documents ever. Um, and also, I, you know, I love historical tea and she's all she's doing is spilling tea of, you know, what the real stories via oral histories, right? Like what Dr. Winbush is talking about with um, Walter White or, or um, Dr. Franklin, Dr. Uh, Hope Franklin's words or this story is being passed down orally, right? And one of the things that the Red Record um, is powerful with is that it's Ida B. Well collecting these stories across the country about how lynchings are really happening and what lynchings are really about, really Absolutely. pushing back against that birth of a nation stereotype of, you know, Black men's savagery, brutality, um, monstrosity against, in particular, white women who are, you know, upheld as this this uh, pillar of innocence or the purveyors of whitehood in many ways. But number one, we know that that's a, a, a myth that covers up the reality of black women's bodies being, you know, sexually violated by white men since the beginning of the enslaved experience, and that continues, you know, through the Jim Crow period, you know, into the civil rights period, when you're thinking about even somebody like Rosa Parks, what gets her into activism is thinking about protecting Black women's bodies from this continual sexual violence, this historical violence. So that's one reason this trope is so problematic. And then the second is that it covers up many consensual relationships that are occurring across this fake slash real uh, color line that Jim Crow builds. And so one of my favorite stories from Red Record is a, a story of an incident of an affair, um, basically, is that um, the way that Ida B. Wells describes it in her shady fashion, which I love, um, you know, is that this, um, you know, a husband, a white couple, a husband had gone, you know, away to work for a month or two and um, neighbors start to see a very handsome black man coming a calling pretty regularly to the home. He's even bringing candies and flowers for the children 
of the home and neighbors are seeing this, right? Like Ida B. Wells is able to report this and that the woman gets pregnant and that her response, her you know knee jerk response in the context of Jim Crow and this lynching era is to say she's been raped. Um, and she tells her husband that when he arrives back home and she's pregnant and she's going to figure something out. So she tells him she's been raped by this man. And of course, then a mob comes, he is arrested. And as the mob is going to do the lynching thing that we've all been discussing, that spectacle of lynching, she has a change of heart and tells her husband the truth. And he goes to the courthouse and, you know, then demands the man gets free. That's one incident, right? Like this is one kind of like small incident where we see that that um, interracial relationships are absolutely not stopped at any point um, by by these laws, and that it's really just a myth that is really um, about the containment of, of black bodies and, and order. Well, Dr. Joseph, I want to take a step back because you mentioned something that is so very vital to the clear understanding, the concise comprehensive and let's say intellectual look at Ida B. Wells. In many regards, she completes the very first mixed method research on lynching. And as she does, she sets the pace. And as she does in her own scathing way, she continues to tell white men, the time is up for saying that this is just about black men and not this mutual relationship. And then she tells black men, you should understand that. So Brother Chad, as we move forward and, and we think about what happens, I think Dr. Wimbush laid it out, there was this immediate call for Dick Rowland's head, if you will. Mm -hmm. Now here we go back to the lynch mob. And what does the lynch mob do? Lynch mob violates the idea of one's rights as a citizen. So until proven, in, until proven guilty. So this, happens and who shows up on the behalf of Dick Rowland? Black men from World War II. I mean, I'm sorry. World War I. World War I. And we're talking about these men were trained. And they have this inter interrelationship, this intimate relationship with their neighbors who are white. That goes back to the lynching at the curb. So when we think about that, we find that outside, as Dr. Wimbush said, there is this conflict. And from this conflict proves that these Black men are not only going to save Dick Rowland, but they're going to fight like soldiers for their ability to continue to contain Black Wall Street. But I need to take a step back. Let's think about this. Tulsa was an oil town at this time. And the oil industry was drying up very quickly by 1921. Now, the Black community and the white community is separated by a steel bridge. So we know that these things take place separate but equal. And they say during this time, correct me if I'm wrong, Doc, they say that that dollar spent around about 35 times in Black Wall Street. Now let's make sure we understand what Black Wall Street means. We understand the Wall Street part, but we're talking about the gap area, Greenwood, Archer, and Pine. Now some of you are old enough on here or have enough experience to understand the gap band. And we'll talk about what they talked about in a little bit to put them into the picture. Go ahead, Chad. Uh, I would like to talk about the, um, the, uh, the soldiers, right? Uh, mm. The soldiers are fighting uh, a war in uh, France, uh, in Europe, and a lot of them stayed, stayed over there because they felt that uh, they were treated much better in Europe. Um, they're treated like gods because they saved them, right? Now, these other brothers come home and they think that they're going to be, you know, uh, 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 ceremonially treated as well. And a lot of them were being lynched in their uniforms. Okay. And this is before 1921, right? This is 1919, right? So now they go and they're going to uh, uh, save uh, Mr. Rowland. But what always happens to Blacks, and I want someone to speak to this, is that we're not always going up against one foe, right? So the sheriff off the sheriff comes in. Besides the people, right, the the general uh, uh, fervor of uh, the citizens, then they bring in the national guard, state now, militia, right, 
Uh, and state militia, you're right. And right. So now everybody now becomes, uh, uh, all black people become a target for all of these various uh, uh, entities. So, you know, my issue is that black people are very strong, but we can't fight everybody at the same time. And that usually is what takes place, right? Um, how do we become more American in which people tend to see us as a victim and help us versus automatically everybody uh, looking at us as the enemy? We cannot fight everybody at the same time. And this is what happened. They brought in everybody, the sheriff's department, the, uh, 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 the National Guard, the state police, and everybody was, was fighting against us. Right, and when they when they talk about a riot, it's not really a riot. It's usually white people trying to kill black people. It's not a riot where it's mutual all the time, right? Um, so I, I'd like someone to speak to that. Chad. Well, before you move forward, brother Chad, um, I think I want to go back and, and I, I'll swing right to Doctor uh, Wimbush. Here's the idea: war in every war that America has, war has radicalized black soldiers. Yes. No greater than World War I. Now we may talk about World War II and what happened during World War II, but no, we know for a fact during World War I, just by using the Houston Mutiny, that war radicalized black soldiers. Go ahead, Doc. No, I, you know, I, I want to use the, you know, the word riot, because every, you know, I, I really hate, you know, up until the Watts. Uh, rebellion of 1965, the word riot meant white people entering into black communities and trying to destroy them. Uh, and, and it's amazing now that the term riot is used to talk about black folk uprising when the history of the word uh, means that meant the exact opposite. You know, and I think also, uh, you know, Frederick, and I think that's what we've got to remember the the double V campaign. Is Absolutely. The, the boys talked about victory in Europe, victory over racism in this country. Uh, there was a trigger uh, for many of the black soldiers when they saw what had happened. And again, the parallels between, you know, what is it when black folk, we are, you know, white folks will always ask the question, well, haven't we made answer uh, is, uh, you know, he said, if a person sticks a knife nine inches in your back and pulls it out six inches, it's a form of progress. But he said, we won't even acknowledge in this country that there is a knife in the back. And so you look at it, we had a pandemic then, we, had a pan we have a pandemic now. We had lynchings then, as you pointed out, Fred, and we still have lynchings with Breonna Taylor and uh, George Floyd. And we had a white supremacist president then. Remember, w Wilson just left office the year that uh, Black Wall Street occurred. And we got a racist president now. So, I mean, so people will say, well, haven't we made progress? In that context, no. It's still things that are occurring then or, and now that occurred then. So we have some activity going on in the chat room, Dr. Joseph, Dr. Wimbush, Professor Robinson, that is igniting. So I think that we're off to a pretty good start here. And one of the young men asked a question. This is Dr. Khaled El Hakim out of Detroit, who is the curator and the founder of the Black History 101 Mobile Museum. And if you haven't seen the Black History 101 Mobile, Mobile Museum, please make sure that you do, because it is in itself discussing the idea of all the things that we understand about Black Wall Street and many other events. So he says, can you speak to the resilience of the Black people of Tulsa, who although could not get insurance for their property being destroyed, but rebuilt Black Wall Street even larger than they had before. This is a story that's rarely told. Thank you, Dr. Ella King. Anybody who'd like to speak to it? Well, there were a lot of attempts to rebuild uh, Black Wall Street and it was hindered, of course, by the city itself. 
uh, and as also by the state itself. I mean, if you know, I, I was out there a few years ago, and it's more kind of museum like now. Uh, the thriving, the economic, as you said, 35 times the dollar turnover in that community is not there. It, it, it's a shadow of itself. Uh, what's his name? O.W. Gurley, who really yes. founded yes. Uh, Black Wall Street. Lit money. Right, who had, by estimates in today's money, well, a, a millionaire. Uh, he lost nearly everything in Black Wall Street. So there was an attempt at rebuilding, but it was never the same. Um, it, it, it was built up, but it still was not like it was. When I was out there, there's a little town right outside there and a lot of black folk who lived in uh, Greenwood moved outside of the city. And one older person told me her mother was actually a victim of uh, uh, Black Wall Street. She was killed, in fact. She said that the big mistake they made, they didn't have enough guns. Right. You know, not enough. Absolutely. And they and now in this town, I think it's called Red Bay, Oklahoma or something, uh, everybody is armed. And we need to talk about that at another day too. <laughs> so that means you're going to come back and join us again, Doc? I will. I will. Okay. <laughs> so I'd like to go straight into it, uh, Dr. Joseph. Let's make sure that we go through the steps of Black Wall Street. So after the initial confrontation came this one day of complete destroying of the Black Wall Street, the Gap area, Greenwood, Archer, and Pine. And what we found in there were men who fought, and women, Black women who fought valiantly. I mean, were not going to succumb, and they fought valiantly. But it goes back to one of the things that Dr. Wimbush mentioned. After that day, that complete day of 24 hours, which would have been day two, there were Black folks who were rounded up into McNulty ballpark. I want to make sure that those of us who are not, let's say, historians, understand and understand these names when they hear them. McNulty Bar Park, which was a minor league ballpark. They were giving numbers, very similar to the Holocaust, if they wanted to leave this ballpark. So that, in turn, reminds me of what happened with Hurricane Katrina and what happened in Louisiana with the Superdome. So we have points of references. So if you will, Dr. Joseph. Yeah, I mean, it's in a similar way how we think of, um, you know, those two in particular came to mind when you were talking about it. But also just thinking about, um, you know, the way that, um, again, internationally certain events are treated when groups of color are experiencing these various disastrous events, whether, Again, do we care about them? Are we actually valuing their humanity and how do we treat them? And I think, I don't remember who said it earlier, but even the people who were victimized, right, fought back. Resistance is really important to think about, but if they're still victimized, this is a race massacre, not a riot, completely right, that they then are treated as if they're the ones who are on trial for it or, you know, rounded up martial law, troops coming in, you know what I mean? And many of these people are, women and children, right? And so we don't talk enough about the, the importance of generational or the impact of generational trauma, not only like genetically, but like the telling of these stories that are passed down. Um, you know, I've been reading earlier um, in preparation for this about, you know, the last survivors of this massacre, right? Being like five and six years old when this happens. What does it mean that we are not healing from these things they just get passed down and what does it mean that somebody who experienced um um katrina for example also later on experienced the earth or the hurricanes that happened in houston right like those Absolutely. are like similar people we don't think about enough how not only are these tied maybe just like in knowledge or you know epistemology like the large understanding of these things but like actually family members and people that you know who are are still dealing um with these legacies and i just think about you know i'm, I'm just fascinated by black motherhood this even ties into 
some of these popular renditions of Tulsa, which I know we'll get to like the Tulsa massacre that is now is being reimagined like by black sci-fi, whether it be Lovecraft Country or Watchmen, like how are they reimagining these events and like putting black women at the center of them or mothers who have to defend their home mothers who maybe are, are widows to war veterans from World War I, right, who are trying to reestablish themselves in those years afterwards, now have to protect their home and protect their children and get them to safety in what is, you know, a a terrorist attack. That's that's terrorism. And that we don't- Domestic again, terrorism. That's domestic, domestic terrorism. That's, in my yes. opinion, I don't even like the word domestic. That's just terrorism. Like okay. we try to label these things sometimes, you know what I mean? And um, don't deal enough with how black people have been terrorized in this country, you know, for centuries, like that is a terrorist event. And that's not what it's called, or we don't talk about it, we don't True. reckon with it. And so then black people can continue to be terrorized by these things. And we're then told you're too sensitive or too sent, you know, all of that doesn't think about the lineage of these stories and these, you know, really terrifying events that black people have survived. What comes of this, when we talk about the erasure of this event, is this collective thought that comes from public education. This being in agreement of erasing this from the historical narrative. And what I found over the years is that those who know the least about the death of Black Wall Street live in Tulsa. So this has been this organized effort but I want to make sure that we understand there were some times where the United States government fomented the erasure of the death of Black Wall Street. When we have the building of the highways and the highway movement of America, a lot of those highways are moved right over Greenwood, Archer, and Pine. So physically, you can't get to a lot of those spaces now when we think about how these things play out in a practical manner. So when we think about the death of Black Wall Street, we think about the roles of so many that have played to make sure that, as Dr. Winbush meant earlier, we don't have concrete empirical evidence to push against because everything is so hazy. And I was always taught that it takes one million conspirators for a crucifixion. So, so many were involved in this particular erasing of that history. And we got a question here, you all. Is from, oh, the great Dr. Rashid Fasol. He says, is it possible to overcome our interloper status? One question. He says, Dr. Derek Bell puts forth the theory of the permanence of racism. What are your thoughts given how black people have done everything possible to prove our Americanness and our commitment to American institutions? That's a great question from the great educator. Um, I'd like to take part of that. Uh, Go ahead, absolutely. I because one of my questions was, are we citizens or perpetual aliens, right? Okay. And from the beginning of our, uh, uh, our existence in America, I mean, we have always been aliens, right? And as much as we try to become uh, more American through every war, right? Through every possible way, uh, it, it is, it's, it's interesting how we are, like they said, the, the constant interlopers, right? And uh, Booker T. Washington in his uh, speech, um, cast down your buckets, right? Um, Black Wall Street did everything that he said that we would do, right? That, that, that's kind of the, the uh, agreement that we had with America, right? And we did everything right. And yet it still wasn't good enough. So the question is, what what is good enough for America from Black people? Look, look, I, you know, one of the questions I always ask my students at Morgan, I ask them, when did Black people become Americans? Mm -hmm. And it certainly wasn't during enslavement, okay? Mm -hmm. It couldn't have been during the hundred and something odd years of Jim Crow. And so if you really, you know, this whole idea that black people in this country are Americans, you know, it's what Toni Morrison says, you know, that we're hyphenated, you know, 
you know, I feel more, I don't like to use the term African-American. I'll use the term American-African because I think we have to center who we are originally. And, you know, every time I hear on the radio after the murder of George Floyd or Breonna Taylor, and they'll say things like, this isn't who we are. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And like Chana Hansi Coates has said, America is full of lies about itself. It still lies about Wall Street. It'll lie in a hundred years about what happened to George Floyd in uh, Minneapolis last summer or Breonna Taylor in Louisville. It's full of lies. And so the idea that we are Americans, I don't believe that we are. I mean, I've got a passport. I was born here, but white folks do not see us. And I don't want to, you know, uh, what's his name? Wilderson's new book, Frank Wilderson's new book called Afro Pessimism. He says, no matter what black people do, regard if we had a, a pill that could cure COVID, AIDS, and cancer, and we sold it to people for one dollar, he said, white people will never see us as human beings. And that's a difficult pill to swallow. And as the brother said in the chat room, Derek Bell was the same way. I mean, you can call it Afro pessimism, you can call it critical race theory, but the fact is, this country will never accept us as quote Americans. Agreed. Um, let us uh, encourage all of you all to continue with the dialogue in the chat room. We are doing our best to encounter your questions and put them forth in a way that we feel like challenges the mainstream narrative. We got another question from a young man named Tim. He said, do we need another Black Wall Street? If so, where would it be? Well, let me begin by saying I'm from the South Side of Chicago. Yeah. And if we think about more specifically, the corner of 79th and Halstead, what we call Auburn Gresham, but I'm originally from Foster Park. So if you understand what that means, you know what that means. So when I think about it that way, um, there has always been, let's say at least since the early 1900s, a group of, if you will, foreigners who come into our community on a daily basis. Now, for the longest period up until closer to the 1950s, they were Jewish merchants. Now we have merchants that are Arab who say to me as a Muslim, I'm Salam Alaikum, when they sell poison, pork, drug paraphernalia, and all kinds of liquor in the community. So in my community, as, as far as giving you a glimpse into the financial pitfalls of my community, we have those who are Chinese, those who are Japanese, those who are Korean in our community every day. And they leave out what, what we call the lifeline. So now we go from Black Wall Street where this dollar turned around, they said 36 times, doc, but I felt 35 would be just about right. Well, now they said the doc, the doc does not turn around one time in my community. In fact, to give you an example, in my community, where I'm from, there is the sale of single cigarettes, single pampers, and single tampons by those who don't look like us. So when we think about a need for another Black Wall Street, it would take almost an entire miracle, which many have laid down very solid ways for us to get there but we haven't paid much attention, let's say in large mass because the most honorable Elijah Muhammad put forth a economic program when we think about how that came to be. So when I think about Black Wall Street, I think it is an indeed something that needs to be looked to, but I'm giving you the real about my community. Anybody can take that question. May, uh, may I speak to that? Uh, absolutely. Oh, I was just gonna, quickly say, I think it's important for us also to think about um, kind of the dialogue that's happening amongst younger activists in this summer and the last couple of years, I'm seeing it more and more in my classroom, critiques of capitalism itself as Absolutely. the answer, as the end goal for us, right? That it, it echoes this kind of what I also hear is a critique of like, politics of respectability or, um, you know, going along with ideals of what it means to be American, which is kind of, you know, this belief in a capitalist system, which is a hierarchical system, right, that is built upon um, free labor and cheap labor and hierarchy and, and, you know, large, large gaps between folks um, economically, 
socially, educationally, health disparities, food disparities, all of that. And so I wonder if it's also critical for us to think about whether what a liberation looks like beyond a capitalist system, right? Absolutely. Like, Absolutely. Um, you know, Nothing like else. if if Black Wall Street is definitely something that we need to talk about. And I think a lot of these issues, the reason that we keep running into them is because we don't talk about them. You know, it's like a, a big has to continue to be erased so that it's like, oh, wow, police brutality is a thing kind of in 2020. It's like ask the Panthers. You know what I mean? Like some of that, you know, like we so because they continue to be erased. So I think it's important for us to elevate the, the story and stories of Black Wall Street. But I also think we're hearing young people say, well, maybe this, it, it, it's not, this system is not the answer. How do we move to beyond this and think about a liberated world that doesn't necessarily look even like a black, even like Black Wall Street, like maybe there's something beyond that. I don't know what that is. And I'm trying to listen to young activists tell me what that looks like, but um, I find it to be a really um, interesting thought. Dr. Joseph, I, I want to, Thank you for injecting that into the conversation. That is what we call vision. The idea of being able to understand what it looks like outside of white, the dominance of white capitalism. See, that's one of the ideological, if you will, problematic issues, what we see now with Black Lives Matter. One thing they haven't taken a stand on as we know it wholeheartedly is the critique of capitalism and where they fall in it. But I think it's, it's working itself out right as we speak with what you say, with those particular young folks in the way that they forward their thoughts. Now we got a couple folks here. We got a couple folks here. Says uh, <laughs> Dr. Pamela Ray. Uh, she's out of San Antonio right now, but she's originally from Philly. She said, it was stated earlier, follow the money that came from Professor Robinson. Plain and simple, they wanted the property down there. I was a teenager watching this happen. Mind you, the subdivision I grew up in is right across from Temple University. I wondered for years what it would what would be done to that neighborhood. I was so scared as a young girl. Now they've moved up into the neighborhood and just taken over. Well, gentrification is real. I give you my example, 1999, city of Chicago. I was a part of an organization that got a million dollar contract to help move folks from the Chicago Housing Authority. They gave these folks 30 days, 10 boxes and a roll of tape. And that was gentrification. So anybody want to speak to what she was saying about gentrification? Uh, I, I would like to speak to what you said earlier about the uh, uh, people coming into the community and uh, having stores and so on. You know, you know, I think the when they talk about the rioters got a, a, a bad, um, the, the rioters, right? Uh, when they're going into these stores, these stores are not part of our community. Right. These right. stores are by interlopers who come in Absolutely. and oftentimes they treat our people very poorly. So when the passion and the fervor and all these things have start to happen, they look to these people not as a, a part of the community. They look to them as the enemy almost. Right. Uh, because oftentimes they call the police on these people. Absolutely. They shoot them. They do all Absolutely. these types of things. And they think that we're 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 um setting fire to our community we're really not that is not our community those are people Absolutely. who come in there to make money and they do not invest in our children in our community they just take okay absolutely yeah. so that is important and they don't really discuss those things in the media and so on they just say oh we, we like we're crazy people. We're just, you know, tearing out our own stuff. We're really, we're not a part of that. Yeah, Chad, Go ahead, Mr. Dr. Bush. No, yes. Chad, you make, you make an excellent point. We've done a study at the Institute. Uh, in, in Baltimore, most of the money that, or most of the bodegas or whatever you want to call them are run by Koreans. And 98% yes, of the Korean store owners in Baltimore live outside of Baltimore. Absolutely. And they take the wealth out of the community. And people say, well, why don't you open up your own stores? Redlining still exists. It still exists. And it, ex it exists in very subtle ways right now. We're doing a study right now, found out that all Whole Foods in the United States, not one Whole Foods in the United States is located in a predominantly Black community. And they'll, they'll use the excuse for things like, uh, well, you know, it's the market driven. We got to, you know, 
people don't, black folk don't eat good food the way, well, we don't eat good food because we don't have access to the good food. So, so we got a couple more. We're moving right along. Uh, the great professor, Reggie Lomax, he says they're always shot down the rise of the honorable minister. Uh, he was building on the pillars of education, health, food, economics. We will never turn those dollars over. Absolutely. We got a question from Victoria. Do you think that in terms of the education system, that talking about the history is enough or does there need to be an active change of thinking when teaching rather than just showing the history? Two questions. I ask this because I think you bring it up a great point that things aren't talked about. I work in education, so I hope this makes sense. Educational system. Absolutely. I think that um, this is, you know, it's like a, a spectrum of things that need to be done. And education is just, I mean, I'm, I'm the child of, of two immigrants, of Haitian immigrants. And so education to them was the biggest thing in the world and still is. And I, I firmly believe that I have a, clearly it worked out, I have a PhD. So I guess they were right. Um, you know, education, education, education. I think it really is key. Um, but it is also about a multi-pronged um, way of dealing with this. And so who are the teachers who are teaching this, right? Like, what does the educational system look like? If the majority of the teachers in our, and I'm thinking of Chicago public schools for yes. instance, are, do not look like the students in the classroom, you know, how many times have any of us had, we've been at the college level, the first black educator that a student has had of the various races. What does that mean? So it's not just like what we teach, but how we teach it, who is teaching it, um, the the investment of, of that um, school in, you know, it's outside community, right? And vice versa. Um, it, it, it takes a lot. It's not just, I think, definitely talking about it, but it's investing in it. But I do believe that education opens the door for us to have those more difficult conversations about what can be done versus, um, you know, a lot of these narratives, it's like it was a long time ago, you know, and those things don't matter anymore when you then look at you know, still like poverty rates in Tulsa right now, 34% of black people live in uh, poverty right now in Tulsa. And this is according to Human Rights Watch. So like, it's not just talking about it, but what are, what does the actual community look like even in these areas? And this is where obviously discussions of reparations and such come up. Absolutely. And, and we've got to, you know, we've got to start thinking about racism the way Dr. Francis Chris Wells and thought about racism as a system. It involves economics, it involves education, it involves religion, it involves a variety of things that go together to keep the system in place. And if we look at it as a system, you know, we'll see people uh, who say, well, they are racist, you know, they may be, but they're practicing racism, which is the system in and of itself. So we got to look at it as a whole thing and attack it at whatever level we can. Okay, we got another um, question. Can I catch you? Go ahead, Chad, please. Yeah, uh, when, you, when you talk about education, and I forgot who said it, um, the oppressor will never educate you to uh, to be better than the station in life in which they, they put you, right? Absolutely. Uh, I forgot who said Audrey that. Lord. Um, Audrey thank Lord. you, thank mm -hmm. you. He's right behind me, so I had to do it. <laughs> thank you so much. And so your education, right, it's very, you got to be careful who's educating you and for what purpose, right? Um, uh, America and, I, I, I mean, the capitalist system is, is educating you to work in their systems. They're not educating you to be bright, to do special things and so on. They, they are, are, are uh, what do they call, um, when, they, when they move you, uh, I've got the term, but they are focused on you being a great worker for them, labor, that's it. So your education, I think uh, uh, Brother Wimber said, has it come from various places? Has it come from your church, right? Has it come from your family, first of all? It should definitely come from your, your, your family first, the church, um, and people who love you, who want to see you better yourself. The institution doesn't love you, okay? The institution is there for itself, all right? The capitalist system. So education, we have to be very careful on what we 
how, how our children are being educated and we have to talk to them every day, what they learned in school and we have to reteach them, right? Well, I can say that I am one who is the epitome of what Chad brought the conversation. I am a second generation historian and the Honorable Professor Willie Dixon Jr. explained to me everything that needed to be discussed. So I sit in front of you, not of myself, but of many. And it goes back to us having the chance to have a Dr. Wimbush here of his generation that created us. So I thank many of you, but it goes back to what you said. When we think about education, um, our brother, dear Malcolm said, only a fool allows their enemy to educate their children. Dr. Rick Stevens, out of the University of Florida, my brilliant brother says, do you believe that we as a people of African descent need to also collaborate across African diaspora lines? Haitians, Dominicans, Jamaicans, et cetera, need to connect with each other and pool our resource. Would you agree? A absolutely. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm very, you know, the whole reparation struggle right now is being twisted by the Eidos movement which only talks about Africans in this country. It has to be international. Our struggle yes, has always been international. Uh, when it becomes international, that's when our enemy really gets upset. It happened when uh, Dr. King denounced the Vietnam War. Yes, sir. Or, or when Malcolm went overseas and started forming the Organization of African American Unity. So we have to keep in mind that our struggle has to involve all Africans throughout the globe. And if we don't, we lose sight of how big and worldwide this uh, struggle is. And okay. that's why Garvey was, was, was so serious to them and they had to in, uh, uh, jail him because what he was doing is exactly what, what, what the questioner um, said, right? Um, collectively unifying and, 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 and dealing with commerce from Africa throughout the diaspora, right? And cut out the middleman. I mean, these things, Gar Garvey was put in prison for that. Right? Well, Dr. Joseph, this wouldn't be right if we didn't let you uh, please give us your thoughts, your direct thoughts. Uh, I mean, definitely. I'm a big um, believer in the power of the diaspora because we're tied together through this story of, you know, disconnect and connection, right? And if we think about how then the diaspora doubles itself, whether we're thinking about what happens in, in line after the, you know, one of the civil rights victories um, of legislation, that changing of that Immigration Act, uh, the Hart Seller Act, that opens, you know, the door for people like my parents and other Black immigrants, whether from the continent or from the Caribbean, to come to the United States and study and, you know, work in hospitals and, you know, all the way up to, you know, we're, in my research, at least thinking about our attorney general in, in Chicago is a, a man of Haitian descent. And so um, the, ways that the diaspora continues to be connected has to be part of that discussion, right? And even um, when we think about how Haiti itself had to pay reparations for the revolution to France and that those Absolutely. payments then were taken over by the United States during their occupation. like And we look at the long-term vestiges of yes. what it looks like right now. Absolutely, absolutely. A billion dollars, right? A billion dollars? Well, let's say this, you all. Um, we right. want to be cognate of everybody's time <laughs> and we got a, one more that we're going to go to and then we'll close it down and i see you dr simone drake thank you for attending we really appreciate you from ohio state university thank you dr simone drake here's the question from brother rashid again dr amos wilson stated that blacks lack a social theory and that the education system system is not interested in educating blacks with a social theory or theory of action that will lead us becoming a competitive people. What are your thoughts? Well, I think perhaps maybe we have cleared that up, but I agree. I mean, the education as we know it is set up, let's say for those of us who are of African American experience to only become more willing tools. Dr. Carter G. Woodson called it the miseducation of the Negro. Chapter one is called the seat of trouble in that first Paragraph, he says, 
the educated Negro has an attitude of contempt. Think about what education does. And now we're sitting around a bunch of folks and those who are listening to us who are PhDs. And I think Dr. Winbush, you may agree with me with this. It's a huge difference between earning a PhD and being a doctor. That's right. In many ways, when we talk about being a PhD, that means you have been had this, you've had this experience in formal education where you have, for the most part, been trained to be a white man without his resources and without his ability to have access to those things that make him popular. Right. So when I think about how the difference between, you know, many of us have studied and secured a, what do they call it, an associate's degree. So that's an AA. Many of us have secured a BA, a bachelor's degree. Many of us have secured an MA. And by the time we secure an MA, something may have gone off to understand what have you mastered. Most of it is European theories, paradigm, and this iconic whiteness. And then when we think about the PhD and the masters, that's that masters piled higher and deeper. So in many ways, you think to yourself, you got an AA, a BA, an MA, and a PhD. And a lot of times it can add up to BS. Because when we think about how we as black folks move forward and how we use formal education to separate us as individuals and it keeps us from unifying on many thoughts, whether it be Marx, whether it be Engel, whether it be those things that we are taught to regurgitate and we use that to separate us nine times out of 10 for our family. Mm -hmm. I think this, I think the education system and those of you may disagree is working Perfectly. Perfect. To create what we call, and they say it, functional illiterates. Yes. So as we we begin to close down, what a conversation, what a time. I like to begin with my dear sister, Dr. Joseph. When we think about the death of Black Wall Street, how would you sum it up and what needs to be said to extend the dominant narrative? that it wasn't um, a random thing and that it is part of both a national and global um, project to keep black people, you know, um, at, a, at the, the hierarchical level that capitalism is built on. And so um, in order to think about why there continues to be issues. People talk about the wealth gap and all of these other things. It's really, really critical for us to think about these sorts of events um, and, and Tulsa being one of them as why the gap is there and that it is, you know, purposeful. All right. So to kind of complete the actions of the death of Wall Street, Black Wall Street, when these Blacks, after two days of decimation of a community, burned down, but make sure you understand there was a financial piece. There was this land grab. So folks went from homeowners to eventually being renters. And we want to talk about generational wealth. What was missing? What was taken was generational wealth that was never ever to be passed down to those who would come after those who built Black Wall Street. So in many ways, I think about it. And once those folks were, while they were driven into this ballpark, the United States government with World War I planes, which means these were the most modern planes, flew over and dropped bombs into McNulty Ballpark. So Doc, what did the Gap Band say? <laughs> well, I don't know if this is going to answer your question, but I think this is when we have to start just briefly talking about reparation. You know, we've tried affirmative action. We have 40 acres and no mule right after the, uh, we've tried everything. The only solution to many of our economic problems is with the issue of reparation. They owe us, they owe us. Secondly, I think the whole, what Dr. Rashid asked about the entire social theory. It was not just Amos Wilson. It was also Bobby Wright. Uh, oh, yeah. And, and Bobby and I went to school together at Chicago. <laughs> Bobby used to always <laughs> talk about the whole need of a social theory. I think that we, you know, some people will call it Afrocentricity or African-centered thought, which is good. 
But within the social theory, we also have to have a theory of economics because as you know, my colleague, Dr. Joseph said, capitalism doesn't work for us the way uh, you know, it works for white folks. You know, there's an assumption that it's market driven. It isn't market driven. It's racial, racially driven, especially when it comes, as you just said, Fred, about generational wealth and all of that. So what we've got to do is develop a social economic theory that works for us. And because we have no alternatives, and you mentioned Marx and Engels, we always go to black, you know, Marxist theory. Yes, and sir. Like that. Yes, sir. I and know we, many that say that. Oh, yeah. They'll say, I'm a black Marxist, you know. Yes. We, Yes, Marx and Engels were racist, but we ain't got time to go into that. <laughs> These are the black power leaders that say that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So we need to develop a social theory. And within that theory, we need to have an economic theory other than capitalism. Well, let me say this. Um, as you know, I'm a huge Dr. Wimbush fan, but let me tell you, I've met Bobby Wright before. And Bobby Wright called it menticide, where you think your enemy is your friend and your friend is your enemy. He also wrote The Psychopathic Racial Personality, where he just, he really depicted the relationship between Blacks and whites as a bullfight. That's right. And Blacks were the bull and whites were the matadors. So I was able to meet Dr. Bobby Wright. Dr. Bobby Wright at one time had the only all-Black mental health facility in America. Right. That's right. So... We got one more question, you all, and it's from Bradley Horn, who's a former student of mine, and I can't let this go, but this will definitely take us out of here. He says, in a very concise way, what can white people do to help? <laughs> you don't want me to answer that question. I surely do. <laughs> I surely do. I, Mr. Bradley's a very smart this. young man. I, I'll say this really quick. I've talked to several Black Lives Matter young people the only time in American history that white people have fought white people on behalf of black people was the American Civil War. And that was, gone, that was good for about 12 years until the Compromise of 1877. Um, right now, you know, Black Lives Matter, and you know, I know they're still gelling and all this other yes, stuff, sir. but yes, I have sir. told young people in the Black Lives Matter movement, do not depend on white people to liberate you. It's not going to happen. We've got to liberate ourselves. So what is the role of white people? As far as I'm concerned, like Frances Welsing used to say, she said, go to the white community and then tell us what white people say about us when we're not around. That's what I would say. That's all the right, best. I'm inspired. Joseph, go ahead. Yeah. I'm inspired by a young generation of interracial activists who are starting to maybe see their identity a little bit more intersectionally. This could be, you know, my own and, you know, small experiences with students, but like doing the work and within one's own community. I don't know if you all are aware of the TikTok. I don't use it, but my students tell me a lot about the ticket attack and, I, and it's just called TikTok. But, you know, that I'm seeing, you know, <laughs> students at home talking to their parents about like their racism and how they were raised racist. And, you know, like these, these anti-black thoughts that are just like pervaded in the household. And, that's the work. I mean, that's the work to me. Like, you know, that's better than a conversation I have to have, right? Like, you know, how are we talking to the people who we love or in our communities about ways to be better? And so, I mean, that's that's the work if, you know, white folks are asking is who are, you know, if we look at even the rates of the last election that they're 53% and some of that stuff, like, mm, you know, look around, you know, you probably know them. That's where the work lies, less oh, than like performative activism, which often is, you know, putting a black square up or saying Black Lives Matter or, you know. Or um, something like you saying Black Studies in Wyoming. Maybe. Um, <laughs> Oxymoronic <laughs> as a good Christian slave owner. <laughs> Go ahead, Chad. Have, who do we know? Who do we know? And how do you do that, those conversations with folks you know? Uh, to me, um, I would say white people should do nothing for us to leave us completely alone. We will be all right. We've built civilizations uh, pre-Europe. Um, completely leave us alone. We don't need you and uh, we'll be just fine. 
It's real simple. Well, I can never thank you enough. Chad, this isn't the first time that you and I have had these experiences. But for the other two panelists and guests, this is my first time. For you, Dr. Joseph, and when it comes to Illinois, it was eventually going to happen because we are connected. But I still, Doc, don't be upset with me. I still want to take this time to take my hat off and explain to all of you all who are here that when we have those around us who have done the work repeatedly and have, if you will, laid a foundation. I had to talk with Doc about two weeks ago and Doc told me this. I don't know if you want me to tell Doc, but I'm gonna tell it anyway. You said you got one more book in you. Now that's what the conversation that you and I had. That's what you told me. Right. So I, I wanna say to you all, there is nothing more important than those who came before us. And Doc did not hesitate. And for many of you all who don't know, you have just been introduced to Dr. Raymond Wade. Wimbush. So make sure that you understand what you see in front of you is real. He is a living man. God, thank God he's a living man. And Doc, I want to tell you how much from the bottom of my heart that I appreciate each and every act of kindness and each and every act of you being a soldier. And we salute you in the way that we should while you're here with us. Well, mm -hmm. thank you for inviting me Bless. to this group. And Bless. I'm glad I've made at least three new friends, so that's great. All right. Absolutely. Thank you, Doc, for everything. Thank everybody for your questions. Thank for you for taking your time to come out and be with us. We look to move forward in February. We have our third installment of our four-part series that discusses Black Studies at 50 and a critical critique. And next week, on the 15th of December, we will, I will be hosting with the University of Wyoming, we will be hosting a webinar on advising black males. So that won't be part two, that'll be part one A, if you will. So again, thank everybody who came out. We can never thank you enough. So. Thank you, Fred. Oh, you're very welcome. Very yes. welcome. You guys hold on a second, I'm sure. Thank you. <laughs>